see you all here again. Hopefully we don't have to meet uh, like this too much longer as things begin to open up. We uh, continue with our series. I'm gonna have to admit people as we go along here, it looks like, but glad you're joining us. Sorry, I was a little slow on the others a little earlier, but um, we're gonna continue with our series today on relationships, particularly husbands and wives today. So uh, I pray that this is encouraging, even if you're single or even if you're a teenager, I think this can be uh, helpful uh, for you now within relationships in general, but um, I'm excited about uh, this sermon. I, I think, you know, um, Satan wants to do everything he can to destroy our marriages. And that is kind of the, the foundation of all society is the family unit. And so I know um, maybe some of you are uh, having, going through a hard time in your marriage. And I pray that today would be encouraging. And, and if you've got a good marriage already, I, I believe what you'll hear today will make it even better. So <clears throat> let's jump right in. I read a survey last, uh, last week as I was preparing. It said the secret of happiness. And if you uh, see an article or something like that, you, wow, you want to know what the secret of uh, happiness in marriage, it said the secret of a happy marriage. And it was a survey of over 1,500 uh, British couples. And so, you know, maybe this is not transcultural, but maybe, maybe it is. <laughs> Uh, but <clears throat> they did this survey of all these couples, and they said they had discovered what the secret to a happy marriage is. And, and you want to know what it is? When you hear something like that, it's like, well, what is it? You know, I want to know what the secret is. And well, it's interesting. They said that of the 40% of the people they surveyed, the couples that were extremely happy, if their spouse, one of the spouses, traveled away from home at least once a month. <laughs> I was like, okay, wow, that's an interesting. And then they said 79% surveyed said that the happier they were, they were happier if they spent time away from their spouse. <laughs> and I was like, wow, okay, that's an interesting uh, result there. The the, the happier you are, the, the, the more you're away from your, your, your spouse. And I know some of us have uh, had to be apart from our families. And Ricky, I know you've had to be apart from your wife for a long time with the pandemic. And I, I know there's, there's uh, the expression, absence makes the heart grow fonder. But still, if we're starting from a place that that's the secret to a happy marriage is being apart from each other, one of you traveling off somewhere, I think you're kind of starting from a negative uh, place right there. But I think today what we're going to look at is the secret to um, uh, a happy marriage. And we, we find it here in scripture. It's interesting, you know, the Bible begins uh, in the garden with the marriage. It ends with the wedding feast of the Lamb everything culminates to this great wedding feast. And then right in the middle, Jesus does his first miracle uh, at the wedding in Cana. So obviously uh, marriage is important to God. He instituted, established marriage. And um, if you remember about a year ago, we were going through John and I preached on the marriage feast at Cana, if you can remember that far back, but we talked about just in general, you know, we are created by God to glorify God. Everything we do is uh, God created us to glorify uh, him. And in the same way, we, we talked about last year that we are, our marriage has been established to glorify God. That's the reason uh, he put us together is to glorify him together. And, and um, it's not just about our happiness. And I believe God does want us to have a, 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 a happy marriage. 
But that's not the ultimate goal, is for us to be happy. The ultimate goal is for our marriages to glorify God. And I believe if we are glorifying God in our marriage, then we will be happy. So we're going to look at three things here uh, today in Scripture. We're going to look at what Scripture says here in our passage, Ephesians uh, 5, 22 through 33. I'll put it up on the screen here. We're going to look at what the passage says about it. We're going to look at how you can apply this practically in your life. And then we're going to look at the power that sustains our marriages or saves our marriages. And so I wanted to bring the passage up here and ask if someone would, would read this for us. If you wouldn't mind, uh, I'll put it up here. And... Let's see where it is. There we go. Would someone um, like to read this for us? If you are, go ahead and you can just start reading. Or if not, I'll. If someone doesn't jump in, I'll I'll read it. I can do that. Great. Thanks, Carol. Ephesians 5, 22 to 33. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ in the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Thank you, Daryl. I'll pray for us here. Can you still see me there? Yeah. Yes. Right. I'll pray for you. Pray for our time together. Father God, thank you so much for your word. God, we thank you that you've given us everything we need for life and godliness through your great and precious promises. So, Father, we, we come to you today. I don't know where each of us are, Father, in our, in our walk with you or in our relationship with our spouse, Father, but I pray that you would strengthen us today by your word, that you would speak truth and grace to us today, Father, that we would... Um, have marriages that glorify you and uh, relationships that, um, that are um, healthy and happy relationships, Father, that uh, point to you. So, Father, I pray that you would speak to us, that you would be glorified even today, and that you would build us up. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, I was a little hesitant when I, when my Sunday came up and it fell on this verse, uh, I, Julie and I have a great marriage. We've been married almost 22 years now. And so uh, I'm so thankful for Julie. And uh, we've had our ups and downs uh, in our marriage, but I'm so thankful. I think someone said, you know, the, the most interesting part of this passage is in, in verse 32, it says, this mystery is profound. This mystery of marriage is profound. And it's, it's, a, it's a mystery why Julie is still married to me after almost 22 years. But I'm so thankful 
for our marriage relationship. And um, so I want to jump in here. Let's just look at the passage and see what it says. Uh, I think the first thing we should notice here about this passage and not just kind of take it for granted, but uh, there's there are specific instructions for the men, for the man and specific instructions for the woman, woman. And, you know, that nowadays uh, alone is profound where all of society is saying, well, men and women are basically the same, you know, um, you know, even men can have children now if you put the baby in their in their body and uh, even genders, people are confused on their genders and uh, gender is basically a fluid thing. You know, men and women are basically the same and, and gender is just a social construct. And so it's unbelievable that society, or at least in America, people have gotten to this place. It feels like we're in the book of Judges where everyone did what they thought was right in their own eyes. But it, it's important for us to realize God did speak to men in one way, and he spoke to women in another way because of our differences in, in our gender, in our roles as well. And the Bible says God made us in his own image, male and female, he made us. And so God has created the genders and the roles in a marriage relationship these differences are significant. Men and women are very different, not just physically, but the way we um, respond to things in life. Uh, we're very different. Our hormones are different. There's a lot of differences, but I would say in the past, Christians uh, and believers have gotten this wrong in that, you know, we haven't, uh, when think of, you know, a hundred years ago when women weren't able to vote in some countries and you think, wow, uh, how, how, did, how did that happen? But in scripture, God gives equal value to the husband and the wife, but there's different roles. And I would say, you know, that that's an extreme where you say, well, the wife shouldn't, the woman shouldn't even vote in, and, and they can't have certain rights or certain that's I think that's an extreme uh, ungodly position that has no place in Christianity but I would say the other extreme is to say well all genders are the same and we're basically the same there's no difference at all I think that's a an exaggeration as well so I just want to acknowledge what scripture says that there are differences he created us male and female and our roles are different, but we have equal value in God's eyes. Second thing I want us to look at here in verse 22, Paul writes, he says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, wow, this is, I kind of tread here um, on, with fear and trembling. This is a, a controversial passage. Many people don't like this passage. It sounds really hard to swallow. Women, wives, submit to your husbands, that sounds, just the word submit is, sounds very harsh, but I do want you to notice something here. This verse in context, if you look at the verse right before it, verse 21, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So this submission is something that is, should be the norm uh, for us as believers in relating to each other. We should submit to each other, respect each other. That is, that's the context uh, of this verse, wives submit to your husbands. And it actually, if you look at the Greek, something I learned, the word submit is not even in verse 22. It just says, in, in the Greek, it says wives and to your husbands. The word submit is not there. It's implying from verse 21. And it's just emphasizing women submit to your husbands. And, and it's interesting. It says out of reverence for Christ. This is the posture of the Christian walking in the spirit. I think in all relationships and in, in Philippians, Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. So this should be our attitude as believers. 
and and uh, but God does say something here specifically uh, because Paul goes on and elaborates. He says the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church. Now, I don't think I've ever made a decision, maybe, <clears throat> but I can't think of any decision that I've made in my family where Julie wasn't a part of it. Um, but someone has to be the ultimate, ultimately responsible in, in, in an institution. You know, whether we talk about um, a country, there's a prime minister, there's a president. If you talk about a school, there's a headmaster. If you talk about um, a corporation, there's a CEO or a president. In the same way, God has said the husband is ultimately responsible for leading his wife and his family. And so the weight of responsibility and authority is on the man. And I think this is, um, this is profound. And I think that we've lost this even today in society. But that being said, God puts the responsibility on us as men to lead our families. And I think that's what, it, what it's about. It's more about responsibility. We as men are responsible to, to, to lead our families and our wives. And, you know, when the Bible gives authority to people in the Bible, there's kings, there's prophets, there's leaders, there's uh, pastors, husbands. Uh, the purpose of that authority is to serve, not to be served. It's, it's for the benefit of the person being led. This is what Jesus taught, right? He, he this is what he demonstrated in his leadership. We are to serve as husbands, not to be served. He came, it says, to serve and not to be served. Now, Paul was writing uh, culturally at that time to the Greco-Roman household. And, and, you know, I don't know what the relationships uh, were like in that day, but I look at... Uh, you know, what you see uh, in some of the countries in the world, how women are treated. And um, it's, it's sad how the men treat the, the women. But it, I do want to say this does not put the husband in place of Christ. And the reason the wife should submit is out of reverence for Christ. Just as um, I would obey a law in Thailand. Uh, yeah, I want to obey the rules of, in Thailand, but my ultimate uh, motivation for obeying the law of the land is to honor Christ with my life, out of reverence for Christ, not to just obey the rules. And so we'll come back to this just in just a moment, what that looks like uh, for the wife, but let's move on to the husband. It says, uh, in verse 25, it says, husbands, Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And this is a high command for us as husbands to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And how did, how did Christ love the church? Well, he died for the church. He gave his life so that the church might live. This is a serving and sacrificing love that we as husbands are commanded to demonstrate in loving our wives. This is not a, you serve me, I'm the head of the household uh, perspective. No, this is, we are, uh, we are given this authority and this position as husbands, as head of the household to serve our families, to serve our wives. And for men, I would say there's two words in this uh, picture here that, that have helped me over the years. Someone shared uh, this with me uh, one time. Julie and I, we, we'll see a marriage counselor every once in a while. It's like going to get a checkup. You know, we have a good friend who's a marriage counselor, and it's like, you know, it's good to go get a checkup on your body every once in a while. And in the same way, we feel like, you know, when ICS offers for uh, teachers or their spouses, we, we always get together with them and just bounce things off of them of issues maybe we're struggling with, because I think it's helpful. 
But here, someone shared this with me, it says in verse 29, it says, no one hates his own body, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. And I think these two words for us as men, nourish and cherish, will help us in knowing how to love our wives well. So I just ask you, men, do you, does your wife feel nourished and cherished? Do you uh, seek to nourish them by providing for them? Do you, do you let them have opportunities to rest? I think one of the hardest jobs in the world is, is being a mom. And if the mom works as well, it's even doubly hard. So do you provide an opportunity for your wife to get time away, to rest, to have good social time with friends and mentally to grow and spiritually and physically to grow and exercise. We need to look for ways, men, to help our wives uh, to demonstrate that we want to, them to nourish them and to cherish them. Do they feel cherished? I love that word cherish. It makes it, 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 it demonstrates that we, feel and we want them to know that they are important they are valuable to us so does your wife feel treasured by you cherished by you does she feel loved valued you know like when you were dating and you know it's like when the dopamine that's rushing through our veins when we're dating wears off you know we have to we have to work at it a little harder it, it came naturally, you know, early on before the honeymoon was over, it seems like to, to demonstrate and to, to show our spouse that we loved and we cherished them. Take your wife out on a date regularly. Do something that would show her that you, you cherish her and that you want to nourish her personally. Now, that's what scripture says there. How, but how do we do that? How do we do that? I want to show you something that's real practical. And I think the last verse there in this passage really helps to demonstrate this. It says in verse 33, it says, let each one of you love his wife as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. And I think these two words, love and respect, are key and kind of sum up what both the husband and the wife need to feel uh, that they are loved. They need to feel from their spouse. You might say the word uh, respect really connects to that word submits. Uh, and I would say as a man, we have a deep need to be respected. You know, I, I would even say more than feeling loved, I would say this way, we feel loved when we feel respected. And you may say, well, what about women? You know, women need respect too. What about the Aretha Franklin song? You know, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, the respect song. I'm sure you've heard that song. Well, we don't get our theology from, from soul music, but... Uh, it's interesting that that song, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, Respect by Aretha Franklin, was written by a man. Otis Redding wrote that song. So women do desire respect, but as far as I understand, as I've studied my wife and tried to understand, it seems that they feel respected and honored when they are loved well. When we love our wives well, they feel honored and respected. And when we are respected as men, we feel loved in that way. So I wanna show you a picture. Uh, I'll share my screen again here. Um, this is from the book, Love and Respect. Can you see that? Okay. This is kind of a little circle here that kind of shows, and I don't know if this ever happens in your family, but this happens in ours here sometimes. Uh, so uh, I do something without love toward Julie, my wife. 
And then she does something as she reacts to my unloving action toward her. She reacts without respect toward me. And then I continue this cycle by responding, reacting without love toward her. And, and it just continues. It goes in this circle, this spiral of doom, you could say. And this, this is from the book Love and Respect by Dr. Emerson Egerich. And uh, he calls this the crazy cycle. The crazy cycle. And, and uh, it, it seems like it once this thing starts in a conversation, in an argument, you know, one of us uh, says something that hurts the other one, it doesn't feel loving to the spouse, then naturally she's going to be hurt and respond in a way that doesn't feel respectful to me, that doesn't sound, make me feel loved, uh, maybe in a belittling type way. And uh, we men are sensitive in our egos and you know, I know I've done things many times. Uh, it's hurt Julie, and uh, she doesn't always, thank God, she doesn't always re respond in that way. But I think uh, when we're hurt, we react without love toward our wives. And when the wife is, uh, is acted on or something is done to her in a way that uh, is without love, it's easy for the wife to respond in a way without respect toward her husband. Does this look familiar to you? Uh, I, it does in my relationship. And this has been real helpful. Someone showed us this many years ago in our relationship. And it, it's just helpful to understand. And, and we've all seen marriages like this, right? Have you ever been in a household and you just feel like, wow, he really talks to her in a way that's harsh and unloving. And then you hear the, the wife respond in a way that not, you say, wow, that was not very respectful, or that sounded very belittling to him, you know, and we both can have words that cut and hurt. And the people closest to us can deliver the most painful hurts to us. But this obviously doesn't uh, make for a healthy environment in any household. And we've all been in homes, we've seen this taking place. So what can we do to break this cycle, this crazy cycle going on? Well, here's, here's what he suggests in this. Uh, as the man, it's a rewarded cycle, he calls it, as we to try to jump off of this crazy cycle, one of the partners, one of the, the spouse, has to say, okay, I'm not gonna continue in this. I'm gonna jump off of this crazy cycle. I'm gonna jump over to this other cycle and I'm going to respond to my wife in a way that he would feel respected. Even though he just said something mean to me, I'm going to respond to him regardless of how he has just uh, responded to me or reacted to me. I'm gonna respond in a way that shows him respect. And then, the husband then should then respond in a way that demonstrates his love for his wife. And it creates a whole another, uh, another spiral or a cycle of, of reward and love and respect and happiness and health in our relationships. So this is it love and respect. This is how we um, demonstrate uh, our love to our spouse. And I think this is, this is uh, a key to a happy marriage. That's it. You know, so let's go do it, right, guys? Let's go do it, wives. Go show your husband respect. And, um, I don't know about you, but it's really hard to do this. This is not something that we can do in the flesh. My first response, it may be something that's happened to me. 
outside and I, I it may not even involve my wife, but I come in at the end of the day or I've been here all day and I say something unloving to my wife, which begins the thing. It doesn't, it, it may start from an outside situation, but to do this is very difficult. And how can we do this? What empowers us? So we looked at what scripture says. We looked at a practical way that we can, we can apply this love and respect to our husbands and our wives. But what, what gives us the power to, to do this? Because it is really difficult. And especially if you have a habit of these kind of cycles of crazy cycles going on in your relationship, um, it can be really difficult to break. And I would say it would take prayer and uh, and maybe even counseling sometimes to, to help break what is it that's causing this cycle to continue in your relationship. But where do, where do we get the power, the patience, the love, even the desire to want to jump off of this crazy cycle into this rewarded cycle? We get it by looking at Jesus. We pause in that moment when we've been hurt. We pause and we look to Jesus, who is the ultimate bridegroom, who has loved us sacrificially, who's given us, he, he given his life so that we could be joined with him. He sacrificed everything so that we could know him. Even while we were sinners, Christ died for, for us. Even when we didn't deserve it, this is what Christ has done for us. So we pause and we look at Jesus, who not only is the bridegroom, but only, also is the one who submitted himself to the Father's will. The ultimate submission to the Father. That is how and where we get the power to jump off of this crazy cycle into a healthy, rewarded, loving cycle in our marriages. So for both husbands and wives, we can look to Jesus who has already done, to the, done this for us. This is the gospel, right? displayed and demonstrated in our own marriages and in, in other relationships. This doesn't just have to be in your marriage. It can be in any relationship that we can do this. And you know something? When you respond in a way that is gracious and loving and respectful to someone who doesn't deserve it in that moment, you know, it's surprising. It surprises people. Have you ever done anything like that? You come in, you think, oh, no, I know she's going to say something. Or, oh, I know he's going to say, I spent too much money. I know he's going to be mad at me. And, and then your spouse responds with grace. Doesn't it surprise you? And is, isn't it such a free feeling like, oh, wow, thank you so much. I know I did wrong. I'm sorry. Thank you for responding to me in grace. And so I heard this little phrase that I want you to remember. I'm going to share my screen one last time here. I heard this little phrase that is um, helpful. This is a little phrase, and I want you to say it with me. Surprise them with grace. We just say that with me just out loud wherever you are. Maybe you look at your spouse. Surprise me with grace surprise them with grace. This is the gospel, right? It says there in five, Ephesians 5.33, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Because, you know, this is what God has done for us. He has surprised us with his glorious grace. And this goes all the way back to the beginning of uh, of Ephesians, where it says, to the praise of his glorious grace. Everything God does is to the praise of a glory, his glorious grace. And this is how we glorify God 
in our marriage relationship. So this adventure of, of marriage is, is just that, right? It's a mystery. It's an adventure. And I just wanted to encourage you that it's, it's the ultimate iron sharpening iron. Uh, and I just want to pray for you in your marriage that, that you would be able to demonstrate and surprise each other with grace. Maybe write that on the wall or write on a piece of paper. Surprise them with grace. Just surprise your children with grace. You know, when they've done something wrong and they're expecting to be punished. Surprise them with grace and let us glorify God in our lives personally in our relationships with our spouse, our families, and in our entire church. So let me pray for us as we finish here. God, thank you so much that even while we were sinners, you died for us. You demonstrated your love, God, by submitting to your Father, paying the ultimate price. God, and, and thank you so much for your great grace, your glorious grace that sustains us, that empowers us, that surprises us every day, Father. I pray, God, that we would be so full of your grace as we pause, as we gaze at what you have done for us. We remember the gospel, that we would overflow with grace and we would surprise others around us with grace. And God, knowing um, that that brings us joy. That brings us joy to let someone out of prison, to, to release someone from their debt, to give grace to someone when they've done something wrong. God, that brings us joy as well. So God, glorify yourself in our marriages. Protect us from the evil one, Father. Strengthen us now by your word, Father. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen.